You're listening to Wild Things and Wild Places, a Muley Fanatic Foundation podcast that aims to discuss issues and efforts related to the Muley Fanatic Foundation mission, the conservation of mule deer, furthering the sport of hunting, and sound wildlife management. Everybody knows I'm a Muley Fanatic. It's time for Wild Things and Wild Places, and here's your guide, Joshua Corsi. Welcome to Wild Things in Wild Places. Joining me today is a guest uh, very excited to bring and uh, have you as the listeners be able to hear this insight. We have talked about uh, many times now over the last, uh, especially the last year, the well-documented and well-covered efforts of wildlife and the impacts that last winter had. And I I thought it would be no better expert to talk about weather-related impacts than truly what I believe to be the voice of weather for the state of Wyoming, also covering Colorado parts of western Nebraska. Don Day. Welcome, Don. Hi there. Glad so you, to be here. I, I really wanted to talk to you on a couple of different fronts. Primarily, you, you certainly are, are well aware of the impacts that uh, wildlife uh, suffered at the consequences of the winter 22-23, and that was well documented. I think that uh, really was profound, uh, is probably the best adjective for that, uh, prob- probably the most we've ever seen, uh, I would think, in, in both of our lifetimes. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I would say that the the winter seasons that I can go back and find where it was somewhat similar. You're never going to have seasons that are exactly the same. But we had some really hard winters in the early 80s that were similar in terms of the amount of snow and the prolonged cold. We also had a, a couple of really rough winters in the late 70s. However, if you go from the late 80s up to where we were last year, we really didn't have anything that got close to what we had. So we can safely say that we were 40 years since we had seen uh, a, a, a winter like that. So that's, that's, they say, what, a generation is 30 years. So that was more than a, gen, a generation since we had that type of magnitude of winter. Yeah, and it, and it it had some devastating impacts, particularly in western Wyoming on pronghorn and mule deer populations. But when you talk about looking at trends and historical data, I, I know that's really where you shine, Don, compared to some of the other more computering models that are out there. His, historical data in, in establishing trends is something that you take great pride in being able to have that type of data set available to you to be able to look at and help, I, I would think, and predict some sort of modeling for what's to come. And, and of course, a weatherman is always, a meteorologist of your stature is always probably asked, what's on the horizon? What's ahead of us? It, there's been a lot of changes in that, but you seem to have a different way of doing that that really looks at what we've had to help predict what we might have. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, that is accurate. We, we call it analog forecasting, which is let's look at what we have experienced. What do we have on record? Unfortunately, we, we really don't have a lot. There really wasn't a science of meteorology until the Wright brothers invented an airplane and we had to quickly figure out, we need to figure out this weather thing (laughs) a little bit more than what we were doing. So it's a fairly young science and record keeping that's reliable in terms of precipitation and temperature and weather patterns. It really didn't start till in this part of the country around the turn of the century. And then the satellites weren't invented until the the 60s and really the 70s before we were able to get a, a lot of that. So we're really not an old science and we really don't have a lot of historical data, but we have enough that when we take what we've seen in the past and start superimposing that on what we've learned, we do start to see patterns and we do see that weather patterns tend to repeat themselves. I think it was Mark Twain who said history doesn't necessarily repeat, but it rhymes. And that's what I think it's a good analogy for the weather, which is what we tend to see certain cycles and certain patterns that we've recognized in the past that we start to see when we start to use some of our new technology, some of our modeling that a lot of people hear about weather computer models and that type of thing. And we're still very young in the infancy, really, of weather modeling in terms of really getting it to the point to where it's at levels we think it could be really accurate, especially when we talk on a seasonal standpoint. So I always default to not necessarily what the new computer model is predicting, but rather is that new computer model predicting 
something we've seen in the past or is it trying to predict something new and then trying to balance the old with the new because if you just do the new i call this modelology which is if you only base your weather forecasting on a model you're a modelologist you're not a meteorologist and anybody who's done a lot of modeling whether it's weather or anything else will tell you that all models are wrong some are helpful and that's my approach. Yeah, Don, specific to the winter of 2022, 2023, when, when you start hearing, uh, particularly meteorologists like yourself, talking about a La Nina season or the third since 1950, what does that do for your mindset looking at that going into last winter? When you have something that's so small in historical trend of what you could look to in the past, what were you anticipating what we seen last year to be what it was? Certainly we thought that last winter was likely going to be a bit more intense than the previous few ahead of it. Did we see the magnitude? Oh, absolutely not. Nobody did. There were predictions at the beginning of that winter, because you got to remember, not only you know, was Wyoming just hammered in, in places with huge amounts of snow, but Utah and California. Uh, there was talk at the beginning of the season by some that thought, oh, it's going to be another drought. It's going to be another drought cycle going through. Um, so I will tell you that there wasn't one meteorologist uh, or climatologist who got anywhere close to predicting correctly what happened last winter. Were there forecasts out there that were hinting that it could be a little bit more of a rough winter? Yes, but not that magnitude. No, not at all. Yeah, I think that unpredictability just comes with the trade, doesn't it? It really does. Now, you talked about historical patterns and everything else. And what was interesting about last winter was you had mentioned there the, the La Nina cycles that we were in. And we had something that doesn't happen very often, which was having a three-year La Nina Simply put, La Nina is when the subtropical Pacific Ocean near the equator is colder. And when that happens, the end result is there's less water vapor available to make it rain and snow in the West, and it's a drought signal. Now, you can do a one-year line and get through it okay, but you put three in a row. That's a problem, and that only has happened three times since the 1950s, and so it sticks out a little bit. So what we tend to have seen before is that when you leave one Pacific cycle and go to the next, you have the chance or the opportunity that there may be some type of extreme weather. Because La Nina brings you one extreme, and in the western United States, it tends to be a drought signal. But when you leave La Nina and go to the next phase, which is cycling into the reverse, El Nino, when the water temperatures are warmer, there's more water available, and all of those things start to make the storms more productive. It, it appears that what happened last year, there are several things that may have come together, but it appears that the timing that the, the La Nina went away and the El Nino started is when we really started to see the winter ramp up. So the last winter, we didn't have much winter at all until after New Year's. But after January 1st of 2023, all the way up to the beginning of spring, it was it, that was the time when we saw the Pacific go through a phase change. And I want to talk a little briefly about the Pacific. Because one thing that I've learned in 30 plus years of weather forecasting in Wyoming is we live and die by the Pacific Ocean. It is the most dominant climatological factor on how our seasons are going to go and behave in Wyoming. And it does look like this part of the country, especially Wyoming, is really sensitive to these fluctuations in the sea surface temperatures that happen out in the Pacific, especially. It seems very far away. We're talking five, 6,000 miles away. Changes in the Pacific that far away can dictate what happens here. Yeah, I find that to be fascinating. It's amazing to think that uh, it's much like an ecosystem uh, on the landscape in regards to, to wildlife. There is a balance, but there is always this moving shift of, of this cycle. And, and when you think about that with the impacts of something that could be happening five, 6,000 miles away, it, it really makes you feel small sometimes, doesn't it? It really does. It's a big challenge, obviously, to try to keep track of all those things, because if we didn't have our satellites and a lot of the technology that we have now to keep track of the things, that's why we're just learning. A lot of people don't realize this. We didn't even 
know really what an El Nino or a La Nina was in terms of how it impacts our climate in the Western United States until the 80s and the 90s. It was, it was just finally people started putting the pieces together. And then once you do that, and that's the thing about Wyoming, is what we tend to see in these Pacific cycles is, I mentioned La Nina tends to be a drought signal, and El Nino tends to get you out of the drought. But one thing you, that's in the historical record in Wyoming is, boy, when we have a drought, we know we do it right. We have a drought. Right. <laughs> but when we get, when we, there's no messing around. We're going to have one. Uh, but when we get out of them, I can go back and show you the last four or five La Nina cycles to El Nino to where we have drought and then get out to where, boy, we get out of a drought in style. We tend to have well above average precipitation. When, what, we don't gradually ease a drought in Wyoming. It's boom, we're out of it, and we're going to have, we're going to really flip things. And if you go back and look at the winter with all the snow, but then look at all the rain Wyoming had in the spring and then and snows in the spring and in the early summer. It was, a lot of people mentioned last year was the greenest they could ever remember. Yeah, and that I, was, I would attest to that. that yeah, and that, so that was after three years of drought. So another factor in here, and I'm just going to throw this out there because this is on the edge of what we know and, and what could have been a factor, but it hasn't been really determined yet. We haven't had enough time to do the, the science and peer review and all of those things. But one factor that could have played a role last year that no one could have predicted is the volcanic eruption in Tonga in the southern hemisphere. Closest location is, is near New Zealand. Okay, Now, that volcanic eruption took a tremendous amount of water out of the ocean and put it not only in the atmosphere, but it put it into the stratosphere. The estimates are that the volume of Lake Tahoe was put from sea level all the way up to eighty to 90,000 feet in the atmosphere. When you think of that, that is, that's a lot of water vapor. Now, that happened in January of 2022, because when that happened. But you don't tend to have these volcanic eruptions immediately affect the weather. There's usually a lag time. But what we noticed from our remote sensing is that water vapor went very high into the stratosphere in the southern hemisphere. But as the wind circulations over a year period of time, we saw that higher water vapor in the stratosphere come up into the northern latitudes. Now, the trick is that water in the high stratosphere may not have been the water to end up making the really abundant snowfall. But there are some, there are some speculations out there, and the physics might work, that the Tonga explosion may have made the western United States winter last year from California to Wyoming, not only were we going to have a bigger winter transitioning from La Nina to El Nino, but that volcanic eruption could have been a wild card that could have added to what was already going to be a more big, busy winter, but made it a lot more busy. Wow, that's fascinating. And, and I think that really puts that in text when you talk about that cycle and the, the impacts of the things that are so far away, five, 6,000 miles away. And then you look at that type of activity, the, the consequences of those certainly are, are still part of the cycle. It makes sense. I'll be very interested and fascinated to see when some of that information becomes available with a little bit more confidence in the science. But are, are there other instances where they're, they're looking at those type of situations or previous volcanic? activity that help in trying to determine those type of impacts and to really dial that in with some precision? Yeah, and that, that's that's a, a good question. It's a question I get a lot of times. It's like, what do volcanoes do? And I said, it's all part of the puzzle. A lot of times, I think what we tend to do with weather and climate, we try to make it too simple, which is, well, okay, there's more greenhouse gases, therefore this is happening. When in reality, it's a myriad of different variables that work together. I can give you over two dozen variables that affect every day's weather and, and our climate. And it, it's like a, a it's like a slot machine with two dozen two dozen different possibilities across the screen. And every time you pull the the slot machine handle, every time you're going to get a different configuration of all those variables. And and how those variables line up from year to year is going to dictate where the pattern's going to go. And volcanic eruptions are one of those. So is solar activity. So is geothermal activity on the ocean floor. Because we you know really what we're learning. I mentioned the Pacific Ocean. Is that 
since about nine out of ten every Nine out of ten raindrops that we get are snowflakes. It's going to have some connection to the Pacific. So the Pacific Ocean is the largest object on the Earth. There's nothing bigger than the Pacific Ocean. And since all of that's upstream from us bringing us our precipitation, the more we learn about the dynamics of that ocean environment, the better we're going to understand the weather because the atmosphere and the oceans are coupled. So the air masses that go across the globe are really impacted strongly by when they reside over the water. And then when that air comes off the water and onto the land, it's going to bring the characteristics of the of what it found and adapted to over the water once it gets to the land. And so what you, you tend to start doing after 30 years of beating your head against the wall, trying to figure out the weather, <laughs> is you right. start to figure out maybe we need to pay more attention to what's what is really driving a lot of that, and that's the Pacific Ocean, in this part of the country at least. Don, does the ocean, in a sense then, is it storing energy? That's the biggest storage of energy anywhere. When you think about the huge body of water that is the Pacific, and then you think about the huge swath of water, if you look at a globe, right. the, widest part of the, the widest part of the Pacific is on the equator. And that is the part of the world, obviously, that has the most abundant amount of sun throughout the course of the year. Right. So that sun does a tremendous amount to heat that water. And so I tell people that that equator area between South America and, and Australia is like the it's like the engine of the car of the earth. The other oceans are important. I don't want to mitigate the Atlantic or the Indian Ocean or that type of thing. But the Pacific has the largest part of the warmest water. And that is energy to your point. Warm water releases more water vapor into the air. You add more water vapor to the air, you, you're, you're making more energy. You're making more opportunities for clouds, which then lead to precipitation and all of those things. So that part of the earth is really critical on, on really how things are going to go. And it's so big, we, you might be hearing about there's a spike in global temperatures right now. One reason for that is we're in El Nino, where there's this giant stretch of water that's two degrees centigrade warmer than it was a year ago. And all of the air that covers that water is then heated. It's, a lot of people get these things confused. It's not the air that heats the water. It's the water that heats the air. Yeah, that, that's a, I'm, I'm glad you clarified that. I, I, I do think that misnomer is out there. And so let, let, let's look at where we're at in this winter. And I got to tell you, only because even though you're right, I, and, and I, I live in western Wyoming, and we seen we did truly see what I, I would call a generational winter, living 20 miles north of Kimmer. We were just, it was, it was like nothing oh, we boy. had ever seen. <laughs> yeah. But what I can tell you is that last, I, I don't know, it, it, it was in the fall at some point. I think you had an article that had been published on Cowboy State Daily that I had several folks, particularly in western Wyoming, say, did you see that Don Day predicted a longer winter? How can a winter get any longer than what we had last year? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you're right. I think it was it was, it was was pretty fast and furious, if you will. It, it started in January, and then, yeah, it, it went to April. And, and so it, maybe it seemed longer than it was just because of the magnitude of how fast it came and then the, the quantity of what came with the, the precipitation. But um, when, when you look at this winter and you make that type of prediction into a, and, and I don't know, is, is this a typical El Nino winter then that uh, we're, we're in the middle of? It is. And, and the thing is, the one thing that I didn't expect is that I, I was expecting that, that once we got into November and December, it would start to be a little bit colder. We did have a, we did have that Thanksgiving storm, which was pretty impressive across the state. Wind River Basin, Lander area got over two feet of snow. It was a pretty good cold, snowy event. But then we, then we broke into a, a three weeks of nothing that extended all the way up till about Christmas time. I was expecting it to get colder earlier. Now, that Arctic outbreak, which we've recently experienced, was really about two or three weeks late from what we were seeing in the fall. We were pretty confident in the fall that there was going to be an Arctic outbreak either in December or January. I was thinking it was going to be in December. It was delayed. But one thing you get in El Nino's is we talked about that being a warmer water temperature regime. You do have episodes where it can be pretty mild because that Pacific influence is 
is really pushing into the western United States. And that's what we had at the beginning of the winter. Last winter, it was interesting. We started last winter with a La Nina and ended in an El Nino. This one, we're going to be in an El Nino all the way through. And the reason why I think it's going to be a little bit longer start to finish is, you're right, last year, I think people thought it was longer because it was so intense for three months there, three and a half months or so. Where I think is, I think this is going to be one of those hanger on winters where sometimes in March and April we'll start to get those warmer periods and you really start to feel like spring. But this could be the year where feels like spring and we have a snowstorm on Mother's Day to where it, it doesn't really want to end, so to speak. Eventually it will, obviously, because what we're seeing coming, we're seeing the El Nino influence over the next eight weeks. We also see the opportunity for another Arctic outbreak. Now, what was fortunate for parts of Wyoming with this last Arctic outbreak is that the far western and southwestern part of the state that was hit so bad with the snow last year pretty much escaped the 30 to 40 below temperatures that we saw in the northern and central and eastern parts of the state. Um, But we've got a lot more winter because we have the ability this year to have another Arctic outbreak probably in February and then this El Nino is going to be throwing a lot more water vapor, a lot more in the way of storms coming our way. In somewhat of a similar fashion to last winter where we saw most of the snow come after the first of the year, same thing is going to happen here. But I think what we're going to see is February, March, and April uh, are going to be pretty active and pretty stormy. Do I predict the level of severity of last winter? No. You talked about it being generational. It's going to be really hard to do that, and we don't want that, obviously. Right. But it's not the same setup. It's not the same situation that we had last year. And you know, one thing I tell people, especially in South Central and, and, and Southwestern Wyoming, is if you were to take a, just go to a map and line up where you heard on the news about all of the uh, big, huge snows in Tahoe and in the mountains of the, in the Sierra Nevada where buildings were covered, and then all the big snow in Utah. If you were to draw a line, let's say from, let's just pick, let's say, Wamsutter. Just say, do a line from Wamsutter and, and go southwest, go across Utah, go across Nevada, then through Tahoe, through the Sierras, then out into the Pacific. The trend of the storms last year were right on that path. And it seemed to just stick right on that path all the time. And if anybody's in Laramie listening to this podcast, Laramie last year barely had any snow. Right. (laughs) Rollins had had one of the biggest (laughs) massive. There was still snow. And I saw the snow and snow fences in July near Rollins. It was crazy. But this is what makes Wyoming a unique environment with weather and climate is that what made it so snowy in Rollins made it less snowy in Laramie because of the the snowy range. The winds were upslope into Rollins and Saratoga and Bag while driving that Pacific moisture in, but the air went downhill on the other side of the snowy range and that downsloping just basically eats the moisture. And I had people in Laramie pulling their hair out, snow lovers. So what is it going to take to make it snow in Laramie? And then you say, just go 100 miles, and, and they would love to share. Yeah, <laughs> but and, we'll and see willingly. that. We'll, we'll, <laughs> and, and willingly. <laughs> but you'll see that in Wyoming all the time. That, that, that's why it's such a big state and such a diverse. We They talk about California and its microclimates where they grow all the grapes. Right. You know, Wyoming's got, got just as many or more microclimates. I would imagine seasonal forecasts are, are just they're challenging just in themselves because of the duration of time that you're trying to, to trying to put a forecast towards. Is that something that over your career uh, you feel like you're further along the line of predictability or, or do you feel like you're still in that same spot of it's just a good guesstimate at this point? Yeah, I would lean to the good guesstimate part of the thing. I always tell people, trend is your friend. The best we can try to do is maybe hit the trend. People, though, the, this day and age of getting precise information off smartphones and stuff, they'll, they'll want to know exactly, exactly how many inches of snow I'm going to get this winter and exactly what day is that going to happen. We're just not there yet. And what tends to happen is you get an idea of what the general trend's going to be, and then you just sit there and hope we don't have one of these variable pop variables like the Tonga eruption, or you have something that that happens that can upend or you didn't see coming, so to speak. And, and I've also noticed is that the winter seasons in Wyoming 
you just can't really group it all into one season because you have segments. If you look at the climatology of Wyoming in the winter, you find out that the lower elevations of the state, the least amount of snow falls actually in December, January, and February. If you start late February, go to March, April, and May is when usually the heaviest snow falls across the low elevations. But what will tend to happen is the lowest sun angle is December and January into February. So if you get a snow, a big snow, in January or early February, tend to keep it. And then if you put a lot of snow on top of that, when we normally get the bigger storms, then it really piles up. I always break our winters down in from really the first segment is mid-October to December, and then I notice that the weather behaves very differently a lot of times in January or February, and then that March, April, May time frame is when we tend to see the bigger, more productive storms. But last winter was, you can go back and look at the data. We were through the middle of December. A lot of people were wondering if we were going to have winter, and then it just went crazy. And to your point, it may not have been very long, but it was very intense during that January till April time frame. Yeah, I think the one thing that I've always been fascinated with your role with the uh, and the voices of of Wyoming's weather is you're really more of a weather historian in my mind than a. Granted, I I think your credibility as a meteorologist goes without saying, but. I think your emphasis that you put on looking back at what we have seen to where we're at and how those are tied together, kudos for that. I, I do appreciate that. I, I think that longevity of the career that you've had is is very storied, and I think you're very revered around the Cowboy State for what expertise you bring to this field, Don. Every year you get a little wiser. I always tell people that being a meteorologist is like being a pilot. When you get in the airplane and you see the there's a kid in the cockpit, looks like he's about 18. You really want the guy with the gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I want. <laughs> because it's like, yeah, he's been through a lot, but so yeah, <laughs> he can handle that storm when you're flying through. And that's what you learn really quick is you know, the thing is that the weather forecasting and trying to understand the weather, you just have to build on it. You have to learn from your mistakes and you have to be an observer. And that's the thing. I love talking. I love talking to ranchers. I love talking to people who spend a lot of time outdoors. I love reading. I'll have people who will share their diaries of from their three or four or five generations on a ranch. We know when they homesteaded, they would write on a calendar the weather every day. I, I've seen weather diaries from the 1870s near Glendo, Wyoming, and they would write these descriptions of the weather every day. And that's gold. But I love talking to the people outdoors because what happens is they become the observers of the weather and they start to notice the patterns yeah. as opposed to just the raw computerized versions of the weather that we get now. Because once you start to become an observer and understanding what you just experienced and try to piece together the meteorological reasons why, all of a sudden you become a lot more in tune with the environment and what's going on. I pay really close attention to people that have had that experience and what they notice. And this might sound cheesy a little bit, but I'm a big believer in wildlife and watching them and seeing how they respond. And I will tell you, I'm a deer and elk hunter. And I've done enough deer and elk hunting where I swear, this is anecdotal, I'm not going to put this, try to make pass this off as science, but I swear elk know a good seven to ten days before that first fall storm because I'll see it. And then I'll be out hunting and I'll notice they, they behave differently. I think, there's, I think we need to be better observers of those things because I do think that there's little signs in nature we're given that we sometimes ignore. Yeah, fascinating. Don, a couple of questions in in knowing that I was going to have the opportunity to visit with you that a a couple of close colleagues of mine have asked that I would ask you. And I I thought if if you didn't mind, and again, I don't want to, I want to preface this by saying you're not endorsing one or the other, but uh, you know, so much of Wyoming, if you live in the Western part of the state and you watch television news, you're getting a a Salt Lake news station. If you live in uh, the Southeast part of the state, you're getting a Denver news station. If you obviously, if you're in Casper, you, you you can pick up the K2 news. But weather apps have become so popular, and there seems to be a plethora of weather apps available to people's phones. Is there one that uh, you recommend over the other for for whatever modeling reason you you've come to terms with, where you you feel like the predictability or the accuracy just reigns a little bit more supreme? 
I would say that the one app that I and and a, and a lot of these a lot of these would mean that you may have to pay for the premium service. But you know, I tell somebody if you, the weather is part of your living, pay a little extra to get the better information. And some of those mean whether it's a radar app, but weather forecasting apps. I'll say that I really like Windy because it does offer you the ability to look at the different models, the different projections instead of just one because 99 out of 100 weather apps that you have usually uses only one one possible scenario of what could happen in the future and when in reality there's probably five or six and that app Wendy does allow you to look at the other solutions to see what that may end up being and also the National Weather Service the closest National Weather Service to your office is also going to perform the best. They don't have great apps or very little going on, but apps are designed to geolocate you based on where you are with latitude and longitude and then pull from a weather database based off of one of those models what the weather is supposed to do. But if you only get one solution where there's no human influence and there is no human influence on most of these apps, you're just getting the raw computer output. And I call that job security because <laughs> what I do is I'm going to try to interpret what I see and, and then make my determination on that. So I, I have a love-hate relationship with apps. It, 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 it's at times I think they're great, but I also I have gotten phone calls where I, I've had weather app predict 40, 50 inches of snow and panicked ranchers calling me saying, my phone says we're getting 50 inches of snow. And sure, the computer model was predicting 50 inches of snow, but that's just the model but it became a forecast. So buyer beware, be, use your experience and, 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 and basically get more than one source, I think is a good way to describe it. On that note, Don, uh, where do you see the place for the much historic resource of what many used for years prior to the development of the apps that are available at the touch of a button? But what, where do you find the place for the Farmer's Almanac and its historical presence that it continues to offer? Is that still a valuable resource? I have fun with it, and I, I will have to say that sometimes they do a pretty good job. Now, they they claim that they do use that historical perspective, but they have a secret sauce that they'll never release, so to speak. But I do think that the way the Farmer's Almanac tries to integrate historical patterns and variables like solar activity and, and trends that have been in the past probably has some credence to it. And then here's something that's really interesting that's some, somewhat new and I think is I think has got the potential to really help with weather forecasts, and it does include this historical perspective. So this is really interesting. So everybody's heard about AI, right? Right. Artificial intelligence. They're doing some really neat things that I think will help weather forecasting. I don't think it's going to make it 100 percent by any stretch of the imagination. But what the AI approach with weather forecasting and that I think is the smartest approach is they're merging what the computer model says with AI going back to, I believe, the 1940s, I think is about as far back as they can go. What AI is doing with weather right now, some experiments, and right now it's encouraging, I would say the best way to describe it, is AI is saying, all right, this is what our computer model says. Let's go back to the 1940s, and does the computer model match what happened previously, and does it make sense with historical patterns, which is really smart because that's what I try to do, which is does the computer match with anything we've seen in the past? Because if it doesn't, that's a red flag. So there's some really uh, interesting things happening in AI that not only is it trying to balance what the projection of the computer is saying with historical precedence, but the computer speeds now can process that historical data very quickly. So what ends up happening is that it actually can produce a forecast very quickly uh, using that historical that historical perspective. So during this last Arctic outbreak that we had, AI did pretty good because there were times the computer modeling freaked out, just lost it. It just couldn't handle it. But what the AI did is say, what? We've seen this before. We've seen this before in the historical database, and this is what happened. And it merges that, and then it self-corrected the modeling. There's encouraging things happening with AI, and it does include that historical angle. 
Yeah, I would imagine that's got to be exciting, especially with your history or or your experience where, where you do incorporate a, a machine man model, if you will, of uh, of being able to, to look at both. Yeah, exciting times on the horizon. No pun intended, but a breath of fresh air. <laughs> there you go. All right, Don, what, one closing thing I, I wanted to ask, uh, just because of the career that you've had, the presence that you've had on, on uh, all of Wyoming, and, and as I mentioned at the beginning in the intro with your, your efforts in Colorado and western Nebraska, what, what's been the biggest surprise in, in this career that you have had? Huh, boy, that's a good question. I guess the biggest surprise is how much people consume the weather and need the weather and how many people are weather nerds <laughs> who just <laughs> okay. really live and, and breathe it. But the thing is that weather affects everybody and everything. That kind of is, it goes without saying. But what I, especially living in Wyoming in this part of the country, I think the thing that was most surprising to me is how impactful the weather is on just day-to-day existence, whether you're a mule deer, whether you're a rancher, whether you're a, a livestock, you're whatever form of livestock, or you're a trucker going down Interstate 80, is that I think this part of the world, everybody says their weather is the craziest and everything else, but in this part of the world we live in, weather is just so much more than I ever thought it was going to be in terms of just just surviving, just getting day to day. It leads me to a follow-up because I, I love that answer, Don. I love that perspective. But I, I, in addition to the biggest surprise, I guess I, I need to ask, what's been the biggest frustration when you look back over the storied career that you have had? Uh, biggest frustration, I think, is the state of the weather and climate sphere that we're in now. I am very much frustrated by things that come out from the large media markets, anytime we have a weather event, whether it's a blizzard, a heat wave, a drought, or a storm, that they just blame it on one thing. Climate you know, change. Carbon dioxide <laughs> or, or climate change or everything else. And I'm not saying here that there's no such thing as those things, but it's not that simple. And I'm really frustrated because since it's not that simple and there's a lot of moving parts to this, and the thing is we could learn so much more and get so much better at weather forecasting if we would dig down and learn all of these other things. So it's very frustrating. I, mean, I hear things every day that make me want to pull my hair out just because, number one, sometimes they're not true or they're exaggerated or they're misleading. And because what one thing I try to do is I try to educate. I try to let people understand the meaning behind things like, why is it doing this? And I'll put a lot of time and effort in that. And someone will say, oh, it's because of climate change. It's like, no, I don't think so. Let's talk about this some more. So I guess and this frustration really has really been over the last 15 years or so. So it's a situation where you want people to learn and understand what makes their weather, but it, it's become a lot of noise. And I think a lot of it's, – it's gotten into people's policy making as well to where bad policy is being made based on some perceptions that they're just – they're, they just don't understand. And so that, to me, is my biggest frustration. Otherwise, I guess I've had a career with not many frustrations, but if there's one that sticks out, it's that one. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Don. I think many that will resonate with that feel very similar sentiments to just what we have seen over what I think you're accurate in depicting the last decade or decade and a half, and just trying to find and put in a box a one-size-fits-all culprit and something that is so complex with so many moving parts and just to be able to put it under the disguise of something simple just for the sake of having something to blame just seems very misguided and very short-sighted. Right, and and I talked about we have a small database of historical records, especially in this part of the country. It's a young science. We really have a lot more to learn, and that's the beauty of me as a meteorologist and, and meteorology in general is we have so much more to learn and understand and to go. And the more we do that, the more we're going to be able to help people and be able to to try to be more proactive with the weather instead of reactive. And that's one goal of being a meteorologist is the hardest work is before a storm. Once a storm hits, your work is done. Your job is to get people prepared. And so that is where we're going with it. But it's It is so dynamic, so changing, and there's all these different variables that we don't necessarily understand yet. So while it does lead to frustration, it's also an opportunity. Yeah, said. 
said. Don, thank you so much for your time. I, I truly value your time. I appreciate what you do and for you to be able to carve out this time to visit about this in a little bit more detail. I know your weather programming is carried on what, almost, I, I don't even know, how, how, near 80 stations. You're, you're the weatherman for a lot of people. Is, is that right? Yeah, we're on about 70 radio stations in the Intermountain West. And as you mentioned, we're mainly in Colorado, Wyoming, and western Nebraska. And I learned it's not wise to go out of your territory too far because you find out that the weather in Iowa is a lot different than here. <laughs> so you just try to stick yeah. around and know, know your so – they say all politics is local. Right. So is the weather. So <laughs> yeah. the, the smaller the area, then the better you're going to do. Yeah. said Don, thank you so much. I appreciate you being a guest on Wild Things and Wild Places. And, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you soon i appreciate it all righty thank you sir and that wraps up another episode of wild things and wild places but remember the journey doesn't end here make sure you never miss out by subscribing whether you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform streaming us on our website or following us on social media subscribing is the best way to stay connected thank you for joining us and stay tuned for more wild episodes everybody knows i'm a muley fanatic 